Uh, I'm excited to be in God's house today. I hope that you are excited to be here as well. We have a word we want to present to you today. I'm reminded of the rabbit who went to the disc. And the rabbit walked into the disc office and the disc said, Mr. Rabbit, today I've got to take a tooth out. We're going to pull a tooth, but it's all right because I'm going to give you some Novocaine. And the rabbit said, oh, no, 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 you don't, Doc. I'm an ether bunny. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I had uh, several people last week tell me I need to run my jokes by them because last week just tanked. And so this week they told me that was at least permissive. We've got a one sentence sermon we want to uh, give you today, and that's this. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up. You up. I had a Bible college professor that gave me two pieces of information that I'll never forget. There is a God. Amen. And I'm not He. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Friends, if you're online, if you're in the sanctuary today, there is a God and He is in control of this planet. And we are not He. Amen. We don't have the power He has. Right. <clears throat> our obligation in this life, our duty in this life is to seek His face. And then he will empower us with power from on high. He has promises for us, over 350 promises when you do the math and add them all up throughout the scriptures. And today, he has you in the palm of your hand. So says God Almighty through Miss Chris. I'm excited today about what God has for you. I want to talk to you today about repenting. Repentance. Repent. We're off to a great start. Nobody's thrown anything yet. I was all nervous just to say the word. We're going to talk about today repenting before the Lord. That's right. Throughout Scripture, it's imperative for us as human beings. To come before God and humble ourselves and repent of our sins before Him. That's true. Because we're not perfect. There is a God and I'm not Him. He is perfect and I'm not. I'm reminded of the time when Bob and Pastor Jim's son, Jackson, went horseback riding. And Bob was going to take his son Jackson, who was six or seven years old at the time, horseback riding. Pastor Jim specifically said, now Bob, <laughs> please make Jackson wear a helmet. Bob said, what, my son? He's as tough as nails. He doesn't need a helmet. So when Bob showed up for the horseback riding exercise with his dad, that put three Ryans on the job side, and Bob said, this boy is a Ryan. What did he need a helmet for? <laughs> and so Bob and his dad got up on a pickup truck to stand up on the top of a pickup truck and put Jackson, the young lad, on top of a draft horse who was famously known for being sort of calm until spooked. The pickup truck drives away, and Bob takes the reins, and Jackson is riding around in circles, and something spooked the horse, and it began to trot and then run, and Bob is hanging on for dear life, and off the other side goes flying Jackson without his helmet. He lands face down in the dirt, grabs a face full of mud. They clean up Jackson, they dust him off real nice, put some makeup on the bruise, <laughs> put him in the truck and start driving home, but Bob just had this churning in his gut. So he knew better than to show up and take the lecture in person, so he thought he would call Pastor Jim and repent of his sins. <laughs> Bob wasn't sure about sharing the story today because he says, I'm going to look like a terrible husband. And I said, well, you haven't done nothing yet. <laughs> in my office and listen to the stories. That's nothing. But today, I want to encourage us to find it in our heart to repent. That's right. 
Repent. There, I take no bones about it. I'm saying the word repent should land like a nine-pound hammer. And the reason why is because I want the truth. And the truth is I'm not perfect and I need to repent and live a humble life before God Almighty. Now, I'm not saying you have to ask Jesus to forgive your sins every other five minutes. What I'm saying is that what the Bible is saying is to live our life with a tremendous sense of humility before God. And what we're seeing run rampant all over the nation and all over the world is this prideful spirit of people saying, I am God. No, I am God. No, I have power. No, I have money. No, I have influence. And God is saying, humble yourself before me because you have jack nothing Amen. unless I give you the air to breathe. Yeah. Amen. Nothing. No power. You can't. Nothing without me. That's the way the world is. And we need to accept the fact that there is a God and we are not Him. If we humble ourselves before God, that's when He lifts us up. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles, my man Cain will find that scripture for us in a moment. 714, thank you Mr. Cain. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and restore their life. Amen. Oh, this is a famous God. scripture that a lot of pastors, a lot of people are passing around, and that's a good thing. We need to take this scripture and bury it into our heart because I think this is the perfect time to memorize this scripture. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, I will hear from heaven, God says. I will forgive you of your sins and I will heal your land. Right at this scripture point, Solomon is dedicating the temple of the Lord to the Lord. It's interesting to think. Because God doesn't dwell in temples or inside buildings. He dwells in our hearts and he always has. Even in the Old Testament. You see, God began to dwell on this planet in a cloud. You might remember the story of Moses at the Red Sea and there was this cloud. It was the presence of God. Then at some point God began to put his presence in this ark of God or this ark of the testimony. And this was a box. And inside this box the Israelites carried this box around and it was a representation of God's presence. And then God took his presence and he put it in the tent of meeting. You see when Moses and the Israelites traveled in the desert of Sinai for all those years. They had a portable tent. And the presence of God would come to that tent. And people would see smoke and the glory of God. And even from outside that building, outside that tent, people would look to that building and the lights would be shining and lightning going off and thunder everywhere. And they could feel the presence of God Almighty. God's presence was real. When the enemy came at the Israelites, his presence went before them. As a matter of fact, when the enemy came at the Israelites right at the Red Sea, that cloud of glory, that presence of God even went behind the Israelites to separate them from their enemy. There's something to be said about the presence of the Lord. Now, Solomon, he's recognized, as a matter of fact, in 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and 2 Chronicles chapter 7, but if you go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 6, Solomon is dedicating this temple to the Lord. But he's humble enough to say and, and express and, and, and relay the information and knowledge that he had. And that is, God doesn't dwell in this place. And I'm not trying to captivate his presence in this place. Because God Almighty has always lived in this cloud. This portable, flexible cloud that you can see, hear, and even smell. And watch work on your behalf. But Solomon says now, the presence of the God is... The presence of God has gone from a cloud to the ark, which in chapters 5 and 6, they bring the ark into now the first temple ever built for God Almighty. And Solomon is recognizing this cloud, this ark, this presence is now what Solomon wants God. He wants him to come to this building, this place. It's interesting. And God recognizes the spirit of the people. And at this point in history, God Almighty is the one who's quoting this scripture. And he's saying to the Israelites, if by chance you get sideways, if by chance you do something stupid, 
I mean, you may not, but if you do, uh-huh. hello. <laughs> if by chance I lift my hand from protecting you because you have pushed me away from you, listen, because uh-huh. that's what God does, friend. When you push yourself away from God, He doesn't force Himself upon you. He stands away from you. That's true. Yeah. That's right. When our nation has pushed ourselves away from God, He has stood His distance from That's us. Right. That's right. God goes on to tell the Israelites, I will judge you based upon the blood of your children. He goes on to tell the Israelites, I will judge you based upon you following idols. I will judge you based upon the sins you commit on each other, with each other, murder, malice, adultery. I will judge you and I will allow your enemy to subdue you when you push me away from you. See, there is a God and I'm not him. God is telling the Israelites all of these things. And if I was the Israelites at that point, and I'm standing on the outer courts of the temple. And this is supposed to be a great big festive day. Matter of fact, there's a seven, eight day long celebration. A happy time, a good time. And the Israelites have come into the promised land. They've been there for years now. Now this is the first temple, the first building to represent God Almighty. But God's talking crazy talk right now. It doesn't seem to be very happy to me. But God is giving a warning to the Israelites. Mm-hmm. He's saying, please don't do these things. Because I can't stand the sight of all the evil in the world. So please separate yourself from the evil in the world. And follow me. And then God says, right before this scripture, if I have to unleash this and that and the other and locusts, And just by the way, there are locusts right now. Storms of locusts That's from right. different parts of the planet. That's true. Right. And they're seeing, we're seeing a, a pestilence plague <coughs> along with everything else that's going on in the world. You can't you tuck that in your back pocket. And then God comes out with this statement. But if my people, and that's me and you, Look, I'm a sinner just like you. I happen to have the microphone today, but I'm a sinner just like you. I'm in this boat with you today. I I think like you. Some of you are like, he probably doesn't think like me. I probably think worse than you. Some of you, and I make note of the fact, you're much nicer people than me. I'm not a very nice person on occasion. I'm in this with you today. We're in this together today. That's right. I want you to feel my heart beat today. That yes, you and I are sinners. However, let me skip to the punchline. By the grace of God, we are bought by the blood of the Lamb. God Almighty says, if my people who are called according to my purpose, you are called according to his purpose. You have purpose on this planet. It is not to flip, flop, and flounder around. Your purpose is to protect, lead, and guide those who you are around, who God gave you to, your friends, your family, your loved ones, your children, your parents, your whatever it is. That is your purpose. And God comes out with this scripture. He's basically saying, hey, you bunch of sinners. But if you humble yourselves. If you get in trouble and then you humble yourselves, seek my face and pray, I will forgive you of your sins. And I will heal your land. Jesus. Jesus. And God says in other parts of the scripture to the Israelites as a warning, I will shake the very foundations of your nation. You don't follow me. And people will look upon you with contempt and scorn and judge you. 
because you have separated yourself from me. I will shake the very foundations of your nation. In 1970, on April 9th, in 1970, is when New York City became the first to legalize abortion. Let me help you out. God says, I'm going to judge you by the blood of your children. The United States of America is not the first to start killing their kids. Because of inconvenience, because of whatever. Listen, Frank, I, I want to share truth today. April 9th, 1970. Before Roe versus Wade in 1973. Going back three years prior to that in 1970, April 9th. Is it a coincidence? You decide, you start reading your Bible, you start praying, you begin to humble yourself. But is it a coincidence that when COVID came out, that still as up to this moment and this day, in the year 2000, on April 9th was the highest peak in the United States and specifically New York City <laughs> of COVID 19 deaths? Does it surprise you that in 1609, on September the 11th, that Henry Hudson was the first to float into, before it was called this, was the first to float into New York City Harbor? God says, I will shake you at your foundation. Does it surprise you that in 1941, on September 11th, is when construction began on the United States Pentagon. And you all know in 2001, on September the 11th, the very heart of America was struck in New York City. Economically, uh, what's the right word? Persona. Everything that America stands for has always started in New York City. These things we need to pay attention to. That's right. Take a step back and recognize there is a God and I'm not Him. Amen. That's right. And it's a good idea for me to live my life as humble as I know how before God and repent of every sin I can ever imagine yes. and come clean. Yes. Now I'm skipping around a little bit now and there, but when David sinned against Bathsheba, if you go to Psalm chapter 51, this is David's prayer. He said, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Don't remove your presence from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. That's right. And he created, he, he did a pretty significant sin with him and Bathsheba. But he gets on his knees, on his face. He says, oh God, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Make my heart right before you. There were consequences to that sin of David's. He lost a child over that sin. But God, say but God. But God. God. But God allowed the next child to not just live, but the Bible actually says that God particularly loved this next child. And that next child grew up to be Solomon, king of Israel, who we're talking about today, who then dedicated the temple of God for the Israelites. David sinned, he pled before God. He cried out before God. God forgave his sins. There were consequences to that sin, yes. But David was mighty successful after that as well because he had the heart of God. I make no bones about it, and I'm pulling no punches today. I believe that it's our duty as American citizens to repent Amen. before God Almighty. Amen. There is a God, you are not Him. I'm not Him. I come this morning with a heavy heart. 
because my heart hurts. My heart doggone breaks. I hate what I'm seeing. I do not want this for our children. I want our children to live successful, fun lives. I don't want them to have to deal with what the news is telling them they're going to have to deal with for the rest of their lives. Shut your mouth, Dad. But the Bible says, if my people who are called by my name, I'm called by his name. You know why? You were created in your mother's womb by God's own yes. bare hand. That's right. By his name. That's you. Yeah. No matter what side of the bed you woke up on this morning. I read of a college student. Before he went to college, his mother made him a, a double bag. And mom said, at the end of every week, put all your dirty clothes in this double bag. Take it out of the laundry room, and there you can do your laundry. So the college student, first week on the job, put all his laundry in the double bag, zipped up the double bag, went down to the laundry room, threw the double bag in the washing machine, turned it on, and walked away. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed pretty easy at the time until he came back and his clothes were not washed. And another individual came up and explained to him how to wash the laundry. You have to take you have to take the pieces of your laundry out, put them in, and and I don't know how to do laundry, but it's a sad story. About four years ago, my wife started making me do my own laundry. It's a sad story. Very sad. <laughs> and now I would have nobody else touch my laundry because I have a system. And one of the things I do, depending on how hard I've played and worked that week, I take my clothes and I even them out around the laundry washing machine today because I don't want to spend three to five hundred dollars on a new washing machine. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on how filthy, dirty, rotten my clothes are, sometimes I even go put gloves on. <laughs> That's how blessed we are. Yeah. 
And we have flip-flop things now. And we look around at how blessed we are and we say, oh, now I'm a God. Oh, no. Oh, now I can do what I want. Because God obviously loves me. And he knows my heart. And he knows your heart is not very good. Therefore, we have to repent, and then he makes us good. We have to live humble before him, and he makes us clean and righteous. Continue. What about in Matthew chapter 15 when the Canaanite woman came? Jesus was, he was ministering. To the lost sheep of Israel. The Canaanite, Canaanite woman came. She's not an Israelite. She's not of Hebrew descent. She came to Jesus and said, Oh, that you would heal my daughter. And Jesus said, Not now. I've only come for this select group of people. And the woman said, Well, give me, give me some crumbs. Give me something. Give me some bread. Give me anything off of your table. And Jesus said, no, it's not right for me to take the bread that I'm going to give to my children and give it to their dogs. Friend, when we're living outside of the realm of humility before God, when we're living outside the realm of, of God, of His presence, that's what we are. Friend, I love you. I want the very best for you. I try to tell my children the truth. You know why? Because I want to see my children in heaven. Oh, yes. yes. And the truth is, without Christ in our hearts, we are yet dogs roaming around on this planet. I'm not saying it. Jesus is saying it. <clears throat> but there's something about this woman when she comes to Jesus. And she makes this famous statement. Oh, but the dogs sit under the table and just wait for the crumbs to drop to the ground. And at that, Jesus turns and says, I love your humble heart. You have, you understand where you're at, what your place is. You understand what it takes to get my attention. You, daughter, your daughter is healed and you are saved by grace because of your, humi your humility. Yeah. She actually repented. At that point, recognizing the fact she's coming from the outside in. I've got interesting news for you. We come from the outside in Amen. to Jesus' right. kingdom. But then we are adopted sons and yes. daughters, and nothing can separate you from the love of God. Yes. Amen. Praise God. Amen. In most states, when you become adopted, those parents, they don't have to give uh, 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 their leftovers to their flesh and blood, whatever you call that, inheritance. You don't have to. But by law, you have to give your inheritance to the ones you adopted. The way God's kingdom works, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. And then you're on the inside looking out. Praise the Lord. In this life you live, <coughs> hear my heart. I'm not telling you that you have to run around and Repent of your sins every other five minutes. You walk out of here and you start building a shed this afternoon, you hit your thumb with a hammer and you say, oh. <laughs> All that stuff is between you and God. You just make sure that your heart stays right. Your heart stays right. I live a life making mistakes. But I live a life asking God to forgive me. <coughs> Be humble before the Lord, recognizing my place in the world. Worship team, you may come. You and I and church, church, church all over, River Life Church, everybody's church, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's only begotten Son died on the cross for you? You've asked Him into your heart, into your life. You believe on Him. And you are saved by His grace. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? It's my responsibility and it's your responsibility right now to humble ourselves and lead by example so that this nation, so that our families, 
might be saved. Amen. Friend, this, if you think this situation is going away anytime soon, I don't even want to be the one to tell you, but it's not going away anytime soon except for by the grace of God Almighty. There's so many stories. You know, I, when I try to have fun with our messages, and I enjoy trivia and humor and that sort of thing. So I looked up some apologies, the top ten apologies in the world, and not one of them were funny. Not one of them did I want to say. That's exactly right. At the end of the day, that's funny in itself. <laughs> but not one of them did I want to talk about today. Not one of them did I want to make light of because of, and there were a couple that I thought, and we can we can kind of have some fun with this. But really we can't. Because apologies are messy and sloppy and ugly and dirty. I believe that I'm all those things ugly, sloppy, and dirty, and all that. But by the grace of God, I'm saved by His blood, and I'm holy, and I'm righteous, and I'm clean because of His grace, not because of me. And at that point, what father on earth, <coughs> what father on earth is going to condemn their child when they come to the father and say, "I'm so sorry, Dad, I made this mistake." So sorry. None that I know of. When Jesus gave this teaching, he said, and that by nature the human beings are not good. They don't think good. They're evil. And Jesus said it in, in this way. He said, when that father forgives that child, think about how much more our God forgives us our sins and heals our hearts, brains, bodies, and our land. Because he is good. Today, just take the word of the Lord that he's given you. Bury it down deep. Today, humble yourself before the Lord so he can lift you up. There's so many scriptures talk about this. If we confess our sins, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, he is righteous and just to forgive us our sins. And there's a time of refreshing provided for us. A time of rest when we forgive our sins. After you say, Dad, I'm sorry, then there's this, there's a celebration. There's, there's a positive note. There's something good that happens after that. We are actually rewarded. And that apology and that, that really heartache time very short time, as long as it takes you to meet it and get it out of your system. And then God says, come on back and let's, let's hang out a while. I will forgive your sins. I, the Bible says God does not turn a blind eye or a deaf ear. When you come call, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've been doing. When you come call, it, it is not, he does not turn a blind eye or a deaf ear. He doesn't do it. That's God's way of saying I got you. I want to know you personally. What he already knows is he wants us to know him personally. He's not going to shut you and say, well, that was too terrible. I can't believe you. That's not the way God works. Some say our God, my God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jesus Christ, Father. They say he's an angry God. Well, you know what? If somebody treated me like people treat God, I'm, I could become pretty angry. That's right. A lot quicker than God has. I mean, think about the stuff that goes on this planet. God is so angry. But He's quick to forgive. He's quick to forgive. Please stand with me today. If you want to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, if that's you today, just repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, I love you. Forgive me my sins. I humble myself before you. I recognize you as my God. I need you. 
thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you're new to River Life Church, what we love to do is just take a moment and allow the seed, the word of God, that seed that's been planted in your heart and in your mind today, allow that some time to find fertile ground.